Hey, it's Greg Stanley. If you're listening to this podcast, you know I love everything automotive. This passion has expanded to include being a car specialist consultant for RM Sotheby's. So if you need assistance buying or consigning a collector car at any one of our online or live auctions, including Scottsdale, Amelia Island, or Monterey, you can reach one of our car specialists at rmsotheby's.com or you can email me directly at gstanley at rmsotheby's.com. This is the Collector Car Podcast, the home for the auto enthusiast. Join Greg Stanley as he applies over 25 years of insights and analytical experience to the collector car market. He will interview the experts and throw in some fun stuff as well. Well, welcome to the Collector Car Podcast. Hey, it's Greg. I've got an exciting guest today, Robert Ross, who hosts the Cars That Matter podcast. So, Robert, thanks for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me, Greg. It's a great pleasure, uh, virtually and uh, all these thousands of miles away. (laughs) Ironically, we're probably next to each other and we don't even know it. (laughs) There you go. It always happens, huh? Yeah, well, I wanted to have you on the podcast because I really like your your podcast i mean it's called cars that matter and you really kind of dig deep into the cars that matter from a historical perspective or a, you know it's a certain automotive milestone or you know something from a cultural perspective and if you would for my listeners could you just kind of give an overview of the cars that matter podcast how it got started and you know the kind of stuff you cover well, Greg, first of all, thanks for that. Uh, I, I, I think you probably did a much uh, a much more charitable job of uh, explaining <laughs> what we do on the show than, than I could. Uh, fact of the matter is, Cars That Matter is, uh, I'm going to call it a passion play. It was an idea of, uh, uh, of uh, Bill Curtis, uh, former owner of Rob Report and a longtime uh, colleague uh, back when uh, I was involved in magazine publishing, and magazine publishing was a great business to be in. Uh, we, uh, we've been friends for many, many years. And Bill, uh, Bill said, uh, Robert, uh, I'm going to be launching a series of podcasts and um, let's do something about cars. And I said, well, gosh, Bill, nobody's going to want to listen to me, but maybe just maybe I can get some interesting people on the program and uh, I can kind of tease a little bit of, of, uh, of, of, of narrative out of them. And uh, we decided it would be appropriate to launch, which we did about a year and some months ago. I think my first guest might have been, uh, oh, our first program was with David Gooding and then uh, started to kind of spool up some uh, interesting interesting folks, many of whom were friends and a lot of whom I actually never met before. But I think what ties them all together is uh, obviously a passion for automobiles, uh, but uh, not necessarily the nuts and bolts, the engineering or the zero to 60, uh, the people that are kind of behind the cars. Uh, clearly, design is really important to right. us and our audience. And I think that's uh, that's probably one of the places to start. Uh, automotive design and, the, and uh, a lot of the great uh, benchmarks that, uh, that have uh, sort of defined the whole landscape from, uh, well, for the last hundred years plus years. Right, right. Yeah. And one thing that really drew me to your podcast, honestly, was your social media presence on Instagram. You do a wonderful job of sharing the podcast in a cool way. I mean, if you go to Cars That Matter on Instagram, you can just see how they share not only an image of the car that is being shared or talked about uh, during the podcast, but you automatically have an audio clip so you can get a taste of your podcast straight while you're perusing your social channels. So that's a great way to do it. And I really appreciate you guys doing it that way. Well, well, thanks for that. I, I have to give credit to the producers at, uh, at Kurt Co and uh, Cars That Matter because uh, I'm uh, in their hands. Uh, for me, it's, uh, you know, it's, all, uh, it's all great to be on a show, but to actually get it out there and, uh, and, and spread the word, that's, uh, that's the real challenge these days. So it's uh, wonderful that you picked up on that. I appreciate it, Greg. Yeah, and you've covered a lot of stuff. I mean, obviously, you've got, I don't know, what, 50-ish, 50 episodes in or so? Yeah, we've uh, we've crested the fifty mark, and uh, typically try to turn out one a week. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's that's that's the that's the game plan thus far. So, being new t- to the podcast world, I don't know if you're new to the interview world, but is there a couple, I guess, automotive nuggets you can pull out? Some some of the stuff that kind of <laughs> struck you as wow, I didn't know that, or boy, that's a great story, or you know, just something that really kind of floored you through your 
automotive adventures on your podcast. Well, you know, it's funny. Every time I, I, I have a guest on the show or maybe a few guests uh, together, um, I end up walking away learning a whole lot more than, uh, than I ever thought I, I would. Uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to imagine that you, you have a pretty good grasp of a particular mark or a car or a period of time, but um, everybody's got personal stories to share. So the, the, the ones that, that I find most intriguing are when you can kind of get behind the scenes and really understand what was happening uh, in a designer's mind with a company when a when a car was was uh, sort of coming uh, coming coming to the forefront, maybe uh, uh, defining a new trend or 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 sort of creating really what might amount now to a milestone in automotive design. We had a chance to uh, talk with um, old friend uh, Ian Cameron and uh, his wife Verena Cluse about uh, some of the work at Rolls-Royce back when the uh, company was acquired by BMW and uh, subsequently uh, subsequently launched the, the, the Phantom 5 back in the early 2000s. It's stories like that that are, are really interesting to me. Of course, we've had some other pretty fun, fun times too. One uh, was a program that uh, was actually put together after the fact. Uh, Certainly, I think we're all excited about the Ford versus Ferrari film, and uh, it was actually a, a pretty, pretty great, great production in the scheme of things. It could have been an absolute nightmare, but it was, uh, it was uh, what I thought turned out to be a great film. So what we did was take some conversations that I had with Carol Shelby. Uh, long before the advent of that film, because of course he, he's, he's been gone for some years now. And we put together a program that essentially brought him into the present to talk about the film and to share some of the uh, old, more personal comments that he made with me back at the time, long before the film was ever even envisioned. So we've, we've had, some, had some fun projects. Wow, that's really cool. And it's got to be pretty fascinating to go back in history and, like you said, talk to the, the designers to get their, you know, their initial inspiration or motivation for certain cars and certain models. So that's a, a really fascinating topic to discuss, you know, with the people that were there and did it, right? Well, you know, I, I think it is all about uh, history is the stuff that fascinates me. And maybe it's just because I'm an old guy, but uh, I'll be I'll be brutally honest with you. Old cars are a whole lot more interesting to me than new cars. Now, I drive all the new ones. I have to do that. I think they're remarkable, and we could uh, probably go on for a couple of hours talking about the latest and the greatest. But clearly, uh, it's the old cars, the history, and the collector cars, and the people in that collector community that, to me, are some of the most fascinating subjects. And obviously, that's what you do for a living. So uh, you I'm probably going to get no argument from you that old no. cars are really great. Yeah, they have great stories with them, and the technology is so interesting. And I can actually work on those cars <laughs> somewhat, not, not a ton, but I can work on those cars. So That's right. That's well, right. I do want to find out more about your passion for automobiles and how it got started. But before I do, when do you typically post your podcast? Greg, we release our podcasts on Mondays, typically, and uh, that'll take through the week. And then we'll uh, have a new one out the following Monday. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that's great. Well, I do want to learn more about your passion for cars. So how did it start? Was there a moment in time, a car that was in your driveway, a car that drove by? How did oh. your passion for cars start? Gosh, you know, Greg, you could probably take my story and put anybody's name on it, uh, regardless of uh, age or generation or gender or anything else, because I think it all starts when you're a kid. Uh, clearly, people imprint early. You know, you hear these stories about naturalists. You know, they put on some fake paper mache bird head and they poke the head into the nest and the little baby stork thinks that this guy is its mother. Well, I think with cars, it sort of works the same. We, we learn early. So, you know, I was steering my dad's TR3 when I couldn't even reach the pedals. I'd sit on his lap and, you know, he'd work the gas and the clutch and the brakes. Uh, by the time I was old enough to drive, uh, started with a little BMW 1600. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd found a Sunbeam Tiger, but my dad thought I might kill myself if I bought <laughs> that. Of course, back then, a Sunbeam Tiger was $1,250, which is exactly what I paid for the BMW. So it started early. Uh, I, I think uh, we never, never had, uh, never had any uh, grand resources in the family, so there were never any fancy cars. But certainly, growing up in L.A., I had a chance to see a number of them. You know, there was a show back in the 
late 60s called Auto Expo. And I remember seeing cars like the Lamborghini Marzal show car, uh, wow. you know, for the first time when it was unveiled. And of course, back then, uh, there were models that went with all these cars. And of course, I know you're not allowed to do that these days, but uh, boy, I'll tell you, there was nothing better looking than some of those gals in checkered mini skirts and halter tops and white vinyl go-go boots. Uh, again, imprinting early. And I think it's those cars of the era that also made a very striking imprint, whether they were from America or from, uh, from overseas. Well, what is a car that you've owned in the past that you wish you had back today? Oh my gosh. Uh, how much time you got? Um, <laughs> you can only pick one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the one that I probably regret selling most uh, would, uh, would be, uh, yes, uh, 1997 uh, Porsche 993 C4S, which I ordered new in uh, Gulf Blue. I believe it was the only one that wow. they ever made that year. Uh, they thought I was crazy. It showed up almost a year later. That's how long it took to manufacture. And of course, I sold it when I had too many cars and there were, uh, you know, they were not uh, worth a whole lot. And I figured, well, you know, it's time to move on. Well, that would have been wrong. <laughs> well, you threw me off at first when you said 1997. That wasn't the direction I thought you're going in. But the Gulf Blue, you know, 4S, that makes a whole lot of sense. <laughs> it, it, it does. I've got some old cars that I wish I had back. Uh, De Tomaso Mangusta was uh, probably the... The, the car that you love to hate. It was the most awful driving car on the planet, but when it comes to looks, uh, there's just there's just nothing better. And, uh, well, I had a 65 Shelby GT350 that, uh, wow. that I uh, uh, sold, uh, uh, oh, going on two years ago now that, uh, that was, uh, uh, it was, it was time to let it go. Let's just put it that way. It was a remarkable car in, in uh, exceptional condition. And, it just wasn't getting the love or the use that it needed. So, uh, so I found, uh, found a, a very, uh, very grateful and uh, uh, appropriate owner for that. Next uh, time you're in that situation, call me and I'll fly out there and give it some love and some use, okay? There you go. There you go. Yeah, that's, uh, that, 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 that car struck a chord. But again, I think it's because, uh, because those are the cars that you grow up with. So I'm 65 years old. So I was exactly 10 years old when that car was brand new. And again, that's when the imprinting starts. How long did you have that car? Oh gosh, I bought it around 2002. And, uh, and uh, so I had it for quite some time. Got an yeah. exquisite ground up restoration from a fellow named Kurt Vogt back in, uh, back in Wallingford. I know Kurt. Cut. Yeah, Kurt's yeah, a great, great guy. Cobra Automotive. Yep, Kurt is uh, no nonsense, uh, just the facts, ma'am. And uh, probably one of the most honest guys I've ever dealt with in the business. And, yep. Uh, you send him a check and you know it's going to get done. And we took right. the, the bare metal, beautiful car with uh, all the original drivetrain components. And uh, it was uh, really a labor of love. Well, is there anything cool in your garage right now you can share? Well, I guess the, 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 the one that I won't get rid of, at least until they pry it from my cold dead fingers, <laughs> as they say, uh, <laughs> on the bumper sticker, uh, I've, I've got a uh, 66 Lamborghini 400 GT. It's an interim, Ooh. so to speak. So it's the coupe with the big motor and the, and the, the Lamborghini transmission and, and differential. And uh, that's been a labor of love now going on since about 2002. That was, uh, that was the first car that I ever really fell in love with. I remember uh, there was a dealer called Bob Estes on uh, Wilshire Boulevard in Beverly Hills. And uh, he had uh, a few of those things on the lot. Back then, the lot was outside. You could walk up to it and kick the tires at, at 3 in the morning if you wanted to. And uh, that, that was a car that I fell in love with. A car that really hasn't, kind of like Rodney Dangerfield, gotten a whole lot of respect until more recent years. I mean, used to used to be nobody wanted those things, but I always did. And uh, that's one that I've, I've spent a lot of, a lot of time and, uh, and, and effort. I need a on. visual. So what are the color combinations? Well, it's the original color. It's uh, called a Fiat Azura Metallica. So it's a pale blue, just a gorgeous pale wow. metallic blue, original color. And the interior was uh, what Lamborghini at the cold called Senape, which means mustard. But it's hardly that. It's really more of a soft, kind of a beautiful uh, uh, pale, pale tan. So a really great color combo. That's a wonderful color combo. Now, what is a car that got away? 
Oh, gosh. Uh, the one that got away. That's a good question. Uh, again, uh, a day late and a dollar short. Uh, I was offered, uh, I wanted a Pizzerini 5300, and, uh, which I, I think is, a, again, a remarkable shape. And I love the, love the fact that it's got that uh, big, uh, big uh, or small block Chevy with, uh, you know, kind of all the Pizzerini uh, uh, underpinnings and a beautiful body by, uh, by, uh, uh, Gijaro. That car got away. Uh, I looked at one on a Friday and, uh, told the seller, uh, you know what? Uh, let me think about it. I'll get back to you. I called him Monday, said, I'm going to take that car. And he said, sorry, I sold it on Saturday. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's again, before they, they shot up to, you know, stratospheric values. And, um, uh, again, you know, at a certain point in time, uh, the cars just, you know, become completely out of your reach. So, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's really unfortunate. That is, uh, that's tough to see it get away. And then all of a sudden they go stratospheric. So you can't even afford them when you do want it again, you know, <laughs> that's right. That's absolutely true. But again, you're in the business. So, you know, the trajectory that some of these cars take, and it's certainly been an interesting market over the last few years. Right. Yeah, for sure. Can you share anything coming up with cars that matter that our listeners might be interested in? Well, I think the next uh, program on Cars That Matter is going to be a conversation with Greg Stanley, which I'm very much <laughs> looking forward to because I want to learn about what you do and uh, talk about uh, the market, which is really uh, the collector car market, probably the one topic that I could uh, I could just listen about, read about, talk about all day long. To me, it's the well, I uh, I do sometimes have verbal diarrhea about it, so just keep <laughs> stay tuned. I talk a lot about it. Uh, that's for sure. Well. One thing I like to do at the end of this is to play a little game I like to call Keep Cash and Crush. Now, you've had about, I don't know, 10 minutes heads up on this. So uh, the way it works is I'll give you three cars, and you have to tell me which one you want to keep forever, which one you're going to cash in, and then which one you're unfortunately are going to send to the crusher. And I've been really, I really haven't done a great job with my past guests. They have found it too easy. So I'm trying to ramp it up here a little bit for you. you. Know, throw me, throw the toughest ones at me, but this is a real Sophie's trifecta, if you will. It is. I'm not sure what to do here. Okay, so the three cars I'm going to give you now, these are all subjects in some way or another of some of your past episodes. Oh, brother. Yes. So I'll give you the Jaguar lightweight E-Type. Now, it won't be a real one. It'll be the continuation car. Okay. okay. Now they're still worth, you know, 1.3 to 1.4 million dollars as a That's right. Car. But you've touched a nerve there, Greg. We'll talk about continuation cars on the next program. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a real Porsche 550 Spider. Right. I think I know which car is going to crush. Um, and then a say a 19 mid 1950s Mercedes 300 SC. Oh, that's funny. Uh, I have great experience with the SC because uh, my uh, friend and uh, uh, ex-employer, Bill Curtis, uh, we actually bought one at Christie's. Uh, he bought a 300 wow. SC and uh, had that in the garage for a, a period of, of years. So that's a car I know a little bit about. They're beautiful. Uh, I think he bought it at my urging and he probably has hated me ever since because of it. Um, it was not a car that was fun to drive, but it was a heck of a car. Yeah, beautiful uh, car. You know, the Spider is another one that uh, the little Porsche Spider. Um, uh, not a whole lot there, but historically, uh, it is about as significant as they get. Unless you were James Dean, you might actually be uh, be around to to still enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, oh, so, yeah. So, which one would you keep forever? Which one would you cash in? And which one would you crush? We got the 550 Spider, the Jaguar lightweight continuation car, and then the Mercedes 300 SC. Well, that's an interesting trifecta, and I'm going to say unequivocally I would keep the 550 Spider for a couple of reasons. One, I'm a Porsche guy, and uh, through and through, uh, in my heart, I've uh, always uh, always had a Porsche. So for me, and of course, never had a 550 Spider. That's a little out of my out of my reach. So that would be a keeper for sure. Okay. The three. The, the 300 SC would be a car to sell. Uh, I think there's still a little bit of a trajectory left for that car. It's a rare car. They didn't make many of them. And uh, if it's a roadster, it's as uh, rare as hen's teeth. So uh, that would be that would be one to find a, you know, maybe some big, big German multimillionaire. So it can go back to it can go back to the fatherland and uh, and 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 command the roads back where it was built. 
I'm going to do the world a favor and send the Jag continuation <laughs> car to the Crusher uh, because uh, those cars, uh, as much as I admire Jag and Aston and Bentley and all these uh, British uh, folks for uh, trying to recreate the past, it's kind of looking, it's kind of like looking at too much plastic surgery and sometimes it's just not a good idea. Um, we don't need any more continuation cars. So to right. the, to, to, <laughs> to the crusher it goes. To, to the to the Guido's junkyard it goes. Well, I, I messed up again. That was way too easy for you. As soon as you said the continuation cars, you had an issue with those. I thought, uh oh, that's going in the crusher. <laughs> <laughs> Now, what actually, let's say, what would happen if I had said that was a real one? Oh, boy. Well, then we've got a problem because I would probably take the, uh, I'd probably take the E-Type over and above the, the Porsche Spider. Uh, that uh, the E-Type lightweight is, uh, is just a grand thing, and the Spider would definitely go on the block. And as much as it would pain me, I think that poor old Mercedes would have to uh, go to meet go to the crusher. <laughs> Good. I'm painting you. All right. That was uh, version 2.0. <laughs> that was a tough one. That was a tough one. Yeah. I, I have to remember to do this. If it's not hard enough, I'll just revisit it in one second and change the cars out a little bit. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. So thank you so much for your time today. What's the best way for our listeners to listen to Cars That Matter podcast? Well, Cars That Matter podcasts are available on Apple, Stitcher, and wherever you can get your podcasts. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time talking about cars and cars that matter. Thanks for uh, having me on the show, and uh, I look forward to catching up with you soon. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Collector Car Podcast. Don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes, and be sure to follow us on Instagram and everywhere else at the Collector Car Podcast.